You've almost got to wonder, is Qatar getting its money's worth? For the third year in a row, its 800 million euro baby, Paris Saint-Germain, crashing out in spectacular fashion at the first hurdle of the knockout phase of the Champions League. PSG blowing a 2-0 first leg advantage at home against injury-depleted Manchester United. Why does a side that's crushing all comers domestically seem to always snatch defeat from the jaws of victory on the European stage? It's uh, hard to pin the blame on weaker competition in the French League. The previous evening, Ajax of Amsterdam, which plays in the far inferior Dutch League, managed to upset Real Madrid. We'll be asking about PSG's shortcomings, whether Qatar has made a good investment, buying stars like Neymar, Cavani, Mbappe, Buffon, Qatar which created a footballing culture out of thin air when the tiny gas and oil rich emirate won, or some might, critics might say, bought the uh, rights to host the next World Cup. Much more than a vanity project, what are the broader stakes? And, uh, well, what to do about PSG? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking what's the matter with Paris's football club. Joining us, Johanna Frenden, football correspondent for the Swedish daily newspaper Aftenbladet. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks as well to uh, Ruben Slachter, co-author of Football Investigation, Everything You Need to Know About Football in Russia. Thank you. Written for the last World Cup. That's, uh, that's true. All right. Sports sociologist Patrick Mignon joins us as well. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Well, the uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate, a lot of shell-shocked faces around the streets of uh, France's capital this Thursday. Uh, even worse, that's the headline in Sports Daily L'Equipe, worse than against Real Madrid last year, worse than uh, what the Spanish call la remontadara of two years ago when PSG took a 4-0 advantage to Barcelona and lost the return leg 6-1. Each elimination is worse than the last. This time was in totally different circumstances with teams that played differently. We did the hardest part, beating Manchester away and coming back here with a good score. We succeeded and then we lost at home. It's been a long time since we've lost such an important game like this one on home turf. Uh, before we turn to our panel, let's go to Antibes on the French Riviera and speak to former French international who played for Paris Saint-Germain, Michael Madar. Thank you for speaking with us here in the France 24 debate. You're welcome. So, Michael, did, did you see this coming this time around? Sorry? Did you see this loss coming? Uh, no. <laughs> Nobody, I think, no. I mean, what, how do you explain it? How do you explain that it's, it's the third year in a row we've seen this? Sorry? How do you explain the fact that they lost? What happened? It's, it's difficult to explain because um, uh, they, they win the, the first game and they have uh, a lot of confidence for the, the return. And uh, you have one... One game and uh, this, this game uh, start uh, very very bad, and they are the the, the Paris Saint Germain player. They have uh, less confidence to to play, and after they play better, and they score, and against uh, uh, a mistake to to Buffon, you know. And uh, when you want to to do a result. Uh, you need confidence, but after this, the second goal, uh, Paris Saint Germain lose this, this confidence, and uh, it's the problem. It's not this year; it's the last year, the, the year before, and I think it's not the the player. They don't have they don't have uh, uh, the mentality to to win this uh, the the game in Champions, in Champions League, like uh, quarter final, you know. And uh, it's difficult every year. It's difficult because uh, they play they play one uh, one league. It's the uh, league one in in France, and uh, the level is very low. And uh, to to be um, pre prepared to play this game, the, it's it's hard for them because uh, every every week they win three, four, five nil, five nil all the time. And you know when you don't have a uh, um, adversity. It's complicated to play 
the game li- like this. And in England, uh, all the, 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 the match, it's, it's difficult every week, you know? Difficult every week. Uh, what do you do? Uh, you, you mentioned it at the outset there. There was a, def- uh, a mistake by defender uh, Tilo Kerr, which uh, yeah. meant that uh, PSG f- fell behind 1-0 at the get-go. Then they equalized. Then there was a mistake by the goalkeeper, the veteran mm-hmm. uh, uh, Gian, uh, Gianluigi Buffon. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you do when you're the coach at halftime? You said it's a problem of confidence. What 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 do you do? I think at? they spoke with them. They spoke with them, but you know, it's uh, uh, it's not. Uh, sorry for my English. Huh? No, that's no, uh, fine. You have you have the traumatism of Barcelona in the hate, and you think about that. You know about this story, and uh, after you you saw Paris, they don't they don't. Uh, uh, they don't play. They don't have opportunity to s- not just one opportunity to score. They don't play well, and uh, they don't know if they, they need to attack or they need to defend. You know, and uh, after they're unlucky because uh, the the um, the penalty it's uh, it's 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 right, but uh, but it's difficult. It's hard when you when you. You play the 93 minutes and you think you are qualified uh, to to have this decision, and it's hard for the for the head, you know, for the the team and for everybody in, in Paris because we everybody uh, uh, don't come on, dit So person ne croyait. Nobody believed it. Yeah, nobody believed it. Yeah, me. Uh, Mikael Madal, thank you so much for joining us here in the in, sorry in the France. For my English. No, your English is fine. It's, it's, we would we'll please to, more than twenty years. I don't speak English. Since, it's hard. since it's your great days French. at Everton, we'll, we'll, we'll be pleased to welcome you back on the show anytime. Do, thank do, you, do, thank you, but, but in French, huh, please. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Mikael Madal, joining us there. Your, your reaction, Johanna friend, and to, to to what you heard from Mikael, that somewhere in the corner of players' minds, it's so much a head game, right? Yeah. So much in the corner of people's minds. It's that incredible 6-1 loss uh, uh, in Barcelona of two years ago that's still there. It is. It is, of course. And I think that no matter how much you invest, no matter how much you spend, you will never be able to buy, you know, uh, experience. There's no way of doing that. I mean, obviously you can buy or uh, get uh, Gianluigi Buffon to your club. You know, he's won everything except uh, the Champions League. Still, he makes like a a fatal mistake uh, last night. So it's it's becoming a culture in PSG. It's actually becoming a club that's known to be a loser club. I mean, that's the only... That's the only way to. Sort, there's no other way to wrap it's it up. It's incredible. We're talking about it as a loser club. It's 17 points ahead of its nearest rival in it's the French that, League. But yeah, but look at the investments. Look at the the ambition. Look at how what they've been working on for nine years, and they never get beyond. Well, they've never gotten beyond the quarterfinal. Now it's three years in a row that they don't make it uh, after the last 16. It's it it's become the, the part of the PSG culture, and that's the biggest problem, I think. But Patrick Mignon, is it a loser culture at PSG? No, I, 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 I don't say I don't say that. Um, well, um, it's, it's it's rather it's rather difficult to 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 build to build a team in Paris, and between the the fact to the the, the will to to be big, and the all the money you put it, and all the different president and organization of have this. ID to to be big, but always with uh, short time to, to 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 do the things and a lot of change in their in the direction of the club. So it means that each time a new president, it means something new, etc. Et so it's not it's difficult to to build something which is a, which in this kind of uh, occasion uh, to to say that we we have something very strong inside us inside the club, the kind of spirit of the club, and we can manage everything, every situation. No, it's it's very really difficult because. Buffon. It's incredible because Buffon, France played against Italy and Buffon, if somebody, no mistake, Buffon. Yeah, no mistake. Especially in the final of that World Cup. Yeah. So, uh, it's maybe it's not, well, we say it's a matter of management. Management. You think that when, when you come to Paris, 
I'm not sure when you come to a. It's almost that for, for it's what it's kind pre, of like pre, a pre, pre, pre retirement for Buffon coming to Paris. A bit like going to play in the United States for some of the aging stars. Is it, that what you're saying? It could have been. It could have been this. Yeah. He's a goalkeeper, so he, he, can, he, can, he can play at high level. No, but you know, it's well, no, it, it's Paris. It's a, it, it's a kind of mystery about uh, it, it, in the whole history of football, not only the, this time, but in the whole history of football. Paris is a mystery. No, no, no big football club in Paris. Only one club. Only one club in the top division, club, no, whereas there's what moment. four or five in in, so, in London and in, more even, yeah. yeah, in the past. Racing, yes. Racing. Yeah. When Nancy was... That was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ruben Slachter, your thoughts uh, uh, Your thoughts on the footballing culture, because this is something Patrick Mignon is touching on, that you've witnessed this Thursday walking around Paris. Well, it's... it's they seem... Uh, they seem almost cursed. That's that's amazing, no? If you look at the match yesterday, because I want to say, it, I think that's, that's quite a difference between, like... Uh, the loss in Barcelona compared to what happened yesterday. I mean, I really thought that... Which is worse, because you heard Marquinhos say this is worse. Yeah, of course it was worse, because the big difference was that in Barcelona, Barcelona won. But yesterday, Paris Saint-Germain lost, clearly. It wasn't Manchester United who won. They, 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 they came here only to not lose 5-6-0. And by accident, they won the game, and they even qualified. I mean, everybody was, was shocked, even the Man United players. And... I really thought that with Thomas Tuchel, the German uh, coach, they, they had uh, changed. They, they also had some bad games, but at halftime he could change something. There was, there was really some change in mentality. And now, at the most important game of the year, they fall again. So, But do you agree with Patrick that there's something cursed? And it's something as well that Johanna was saying. Is there something cursed with Paris Saint-Germain? That's what they are saying right now. Okay, uh, I'm not that into curse. Well, I'm, I'm a Dutchman, so we are always <laughs> cursed. We lost all our finals play. But <laughs> that's another story. But, I mean, I, I really thought that, that something had changed. And now we, we are still back at the same, uh, at the same point as... as uh, as in Barcelona, so that's yeah, it's it's strange, it's strange. All right, let let's stay on the subject of mm -hmm. the Dutch. You could call it cold comfort. The previous night, Ajax beat the world's richest club, Real Madrid. It was a four-one scoreline, and they did it at the Bernabeu. They're rascals, scoundrels. All the players are mercenaries. Ajax is a team with no quality. They're no better than us, and made a mockery of us in our stadium. Yeah, they, they, we, we saw those images on social media of uh, Ajax fans singing "Always Look on the Bright Side of Life." Uh, uh, it's it's and again, you know, you heard Mikael Meda at the beginning saying, "Well, the problem is that when you're PSG, you play in a domestic league which isn't so strong. It's hard to get uh, psyched up for the big game." But Ajax just proved the opposite, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a difference between Ajax and and PSG. Ajax has a has a. Um as a philosophy that is for, uh, there for already 50 years. They do the same thing. Young players, young Dutch players to get them play all together. I have to say that this year there's a little difference that they bought two free experienced players, especially Dusan Tadic, the Serbian player, who was by far the best player on the pitch in Madrid. And they got some combination and it, it works. Paris Saint-Germain is a whole different story. They, the, they first, when the Qatari arrived, of course, they, they, they took over the club. They first wanted to make the brand Paris Saint-Germain count. And now it is time to win all those prizes. But they don't manage to do it. But yeah, if they want to follow Ajax, they should start with young French players, for example. But it's, I don't know if that's the whole uh, philosophy. Are we being a little unfair, Johanna, when we, when we say that? Because, yeah, there are, I guess, the equivalent of what they call it, Real Madrid Galacticos, at, obviously at Paris Saint-Germain, very high paid superstars, but there are a lot of homegrown players on the team. I counted six or seven of them uh, in the roster uh, who, it, well, there's, a, there's a mix. It, it's, bec it's become a little bit better perhaps in, you know, if you look at the real Parisians who've made it into the squad, but the PSG have sacrificed lots of homegrown players, you know, during the course of these last uh, eight or nine seasons because they wanted to really get the big names, not necessarily the best players, but really the biggest names, you know, with obviously good players as well. 
no, no, but what can you say about a uh, player like as uh, Neymar? Zlatan Ibrahimovic, of course. But there's all, you know, there has been the David Beckhams, the odd signing just to get uh, a big name, a bit of spotlight, create a product around the PSG, but not really creating a culture, you know, not really creating a footballing culture. So, the so fact a publicity stunt, like getting Buffon, that's a publicity stunt? Of course it is, yeah, of course, no doubt. Of course it is. Because he's 41 and. It's, it's a great, it's a good. Uh, you know, it's a very good goalkeeper, but it's not something that you would, you know, I wouldn't put my money on somebody for that, you know, for the future. So if you want to build for the future, you would go probably for something else. They actually do have a real good uh, homegrown Parisian, you know, on the bench. And I think, to me at least, uh, Alphonse Arrigola has proved as good as Buffon this season. So I think, I mean, I th- it's there's lots of reasons for this, but when it comes down to what happened last night, it's if you compare it to the Camp Nou two years ago. I, I mean, I happen to be at the you know both games. It's the feeling in the stadium that it's happening again, you know, mm-hmm. and that was right after the first goal last night. It happened within seconds, you know, within two minutes of uh, the game. Same thing happened in Barcelona back in 2017, and you can just feel that everybody in the Parc de Princes was feeling. <gasps> Is this happening again? So if that's what 50,000 people think, of course that's what the players think. Of course that's what the the manager is going to think. It's was, it's just contaminated, you know. It was like, I mean, with, with a penalty uh, at the end, I thought the, the public wasn't even that disturbed. I mean, they went quiet. They were like, this is not happening again. I, where's the frustration, you know? Yeah, we, I, that's we, what I thought. Okay, the penalty, it was uh, VAR. It was, uh, it was the video speaking into the ear of the referee who said, hey, go take a look. And that's how they discovered that, yes, it was... Uh, a handball in, in this case, which if you apply the letter of the law, it is. But we heard, you know, we heard the reaction on Instagram of Neymar calling it a disgrace. But there hasn't been, th- as you say, there hasn't been that much of a reaction over no. it. Why? Because uh, I think what you said before is the fact that PSG lost this game more than Manchester United winning it, you know. And no matter, even, even if that penalty never would have happened... The, it was still a bad game from PSG. You know, they took, they got, a, they had a really, really good um, result to play on. They took large risks. They didn't do what they should, and the, they lost this game. I mean, the, the no matter what happened in the end, it was completely their own fault. Actually, there was nothing in the game last night that uh, was, you know, what PSG planned to do. I imagine they they just got. Uh, completely, they were beside themselves and that that's uh, the whole truth, I think. All right, we're going to ask the rest of our panel what they think about uh, branding, new technology, and also Paris Saint-Germain's owners. When we come back, stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're looking at, uh, well, the third year in a row where Paris Saint-Germain dominates the French domestic league and crashes out at the first hurdle of the knockout phase in the Champions League in spectacular fashion against Manchester United, against an injury-depleted Manchester United. With us to talk about it, Johanna Frenden, football correspondent for the Swedish newspaper Aften Blattet. Also with us, Ruben Slachter, co-author of Football Investigation, Everything You Need to Know About Football in Russia, and sports sociologist uh, Patrick Mignon. Just before the break, we were uh, asking about uh, the changes in football, merchandising, publicity, players as publicity stunts, but also video, the, the video replay in this case. So it's the 92nd minute and the goal that decides it all. At first, the ref whistles no penalty, Ruben, and then he hears something in his ear and goes over and checks the video. Yeah, we're all talking about making the game more fair. And of course, well, the problem with the, those kinds of decisions is that it's not unanimous. Uh, you see the referee is... You see him hesitating. I mean, how how much time he stayed there? You were in the stadium, Johanna, for maybe three, four minutes yeah, or so. Like well, it means that he wasn't sure. And maybe the VR was a little bit more sure, but uh, you can still debate about it. And I think that's that's quite a uh, huge problem. And what I think is a bad thing, I mean, okay, you can say that it was a penalty or it wasn't, but the bad thing is that the referees are now are losing their identity. They're all the time just afraid to be corrected by... VAR. They don't take any decisions anymore because they will know that there's someone watching at the television just taking their uh, their uh, their role. So I think I think that that's that's quite a bad thing. Patrick Mignon, you agree? Uh, <clears throat> I agree uh, because I, I, I'm thinking about rugby, right? 
Well, rugby, there is a kind of real organization of a referee. The, the line referee, the, the VAR, and the, uh, and the field referee. But it's always the man on the field who, yeah. who asks yeah. for, for yes. the replay. Yes. Well, well, it's, well, but what I saw, yes. It's not the so other way around. Because he's not sure of what he saw. Right. And he asked for the... For, for, but clearly for somebody video. said something to him in his ear this time, right? But this is the... I, I remember f uh, in the final against France and Italy, it was on the referee who... who Take the decision. It was also the not, not maybe not the, the, the video, fourth referee, the, probably. Yeah, he yeah. saw it. The fourth, the fourth for the referee. headbutt of uh, Zinedine Zidane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we've had the first casualty from uh, last night's action, not in the match between uh, uh, Paris Saint Germain and Manchester United, but Roma's coach has been sacked after Porto uh, defeated Roma. Uh, your thoughts on on Johanna Friend and on on. The fact that, you know, it's high pressure, the Champions League, and, well, the coaches, and they don't last very long in Paris, it seems, either, by the way. No, they certainly don't. I mean, I, it's everybody's wondering, of course, will uh, Thomas Tuchel be able to continue? Uh, will PSG give him another season? I think they probably will do so, because what happened, you know, in the last two seasons, Unai Emery got to the same stage. He was actually in charge when, when uh, they lost against Barcelona that very uh, dreadful night did that camp now so it still proves though that you know it's the the the, the, the well the the patience i guess the span of patience with managers has grown uh, shorter and shorter in international football everybody is looking everywhere else to see if they maybe could get somebody better maybe he wasn't as fit for this job as we thought maybe we should go for a young one maybe for someone more experienced mm -hmm. maybe somebody who's from the area there's lots of different you know ideas and uh, philosophies that and and this is where when i'm saying that psg has no real footballing culture you can really see it in these kind of uh, circumstances because mm -hmm. they have no patience with their uh, mm -hmm. managers they appoint them and then they ask something different from them than you know what they announced when they arrived like, i need time can I you make the same can you make the same criticism level the same criticism against manchester united's american owners who are also accused of not having a footballing culture it's a very particular club, of course, because having had uh, for like 20 years the same, 20-odd uh, years, the same manager, how can you, I mean, obviously you don't know how to handle that afterwards, speaking of, of course of Alex Ferguson. Uh, PSG is not in that situation. They, they became a big club when Qatar came and started mm -hmm. investing uh, uh, 10 years ago, more or less. But they still haven't really found, found an identity. They do not know who they are exactly, and this opportunism is very much shown in how they pick and how they get rid of their managers. Let's pick up on that. When Qatar bought Paris Saint-Germain, it was in 2011. It was hot on the heels of uh, the tiny emirate winning the rights to host the 2022 World Cup, a country which at the time had no big stadium, no mark on the world football stage, suddenly had a marquee name all its own. Maud Julien has more. They did even worse, writes the French sports publication L'Equipe, while others deemed its defeat against Manchester United unforgivable. Perhaps because of the amount of money the club has spent in trying to win the European Champions League. An estimated 1.17 billion euros on players, including over 400 million euros on the transfer of stars Neymar Jr. and Kylian Mbappe alone. Qatar Sports Investment acquired the club in 2011 in what was seen as a bid to yield diplomatic influence and better its image. Its president, Nasir Ghanam al Khelaifi, is a close friend of the Prince of Qatar. Since then, the Paris Saint-Germain has spent a lot of money on new players, opened a boutique on the Champs-Élysées, but failed to win any major cups outside of France. Spectacularly, in a game dubbed the Remontada, it lost at home against Barcelona 6-0 in the 2017 UFA Cup. Now, this defeat has made one thing clear. Money counts for almost everything in football, but not quite everything. And the club may even be in trouble. Under the UFA rules of financial fair play, clubs can only spend as much as they make. A cup victory would have brought in 30 million euros, which the Paris Saint-Germain badly needs. Let's talk about financial fair play. This breaking news, Patrick Mignon, involving not Paris Saint-Germain, but uh, another team owned uh, from the Gulf, Manchester City, 
Europe's uh, soccer body, UEFA, opening a formal investigation into Man City over potential breaches of its break-even rule uh, for the financial fair play. Up to now, you know, when financial fair play was first announced, we thought it was going to radically change things. Big clubs have somehow managed to skirt it for the time being. Yes, it was a, it was a dream at the, at the moment, but it could be the... To, 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 to put again equality among the teams and to, to have the opportunity to see small clubs like Ajax compared to, to the big one, no, to the big one, and to say the difference, no, it, 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 it to be an opportunity to, to put again the suspense in the, in the competition. But, they, but it failed because, because there is the contradiction between the, the fact that you want that they, if, you, if you define football as an economic uh, affair, business. You are very attentive to the fact that you can go against the people who put money in football because it's good for football. It's, it's a world game. Uh, we are everywhere in the world, so it's very good. So to to put in to to put really in place this uh, the, this uh, this fair play, it's uh, it means that you have to. To, to think about the consequences. And I think now there are more and more consequences because of the, the money which is going into the football and the, all, the, all the facts that so know from the report. So if I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Patrick, if, mm. uh, you're thinking about the consequences, but if you're a Paris Saint-Germain fan and last night they win instead of losing, do you really care about financial fair play? No, of course. You don't. You don't. You don't. You, 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 you don't. You, you, you will. You, you will take care of the next time because the Paris Saint Germain. They, they lost. They 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 have been qualified. So it means that they, they they lose a lot of money, and it means that if they lose the money, and in fact that this uh, the fair play, the, the equity fair play, uh, is 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 making is uh, is going his way. It means that Paris Saint Germain. We have a lot of much more problem to to have this to to build this wonderful team with yeah, a lot of revenue players, loss very well known player a lot of revenue go, loss to go into his his project of a the brand project of Paris Saint Germain as you say um, it will be more and more difficult and I think that the family also of a of a president of Paris Saint Germain is not really happy about yeah a lot of revenue loss from not making it to the quarters of the semis uh, buying it, Neymar and Mbappe pushing PSG further up the ladder of clubs with the biggest revenue. More than 500 million, according to consultants Deloitte. By the way, uh, Ruben, Ajax's revenue of 92 million doesn't even put the Dutch side in the top 30 of uh, Deloitte's list. Uh, again, th these numbers are crazy. When you, and th this is the revenue we just saw on that on that on on that chart. Yeah, it's for sure. I mean, well, I, again, it's it's a whole different kind of philosophy how you see the how you see the, the sports. I mean, PSG has also a lot of business involved in it. I think when they bought Mbappe and, and Neymar, they knew that they needed desperately big results straight away because at one point you need your money back. So when they lost last year against Real Madrid, it was already uh, bad for them. But this year, I think it is even worse. If you look now in the Champions League, there was all, almost all the big clubs are out. This was their moment to win that, that cup and to earn back all the money they invested in their two big stars. So maybe yeah, this will be this summer will be quite a huge uh, turning point for them. Maybe they should sell, uh, sh sell one of the two. And which brings us back to what you were saying earlier about the, the footballing culture at uh, Paris Saint-Germain. What do you make of the Qatari ownership? Well, I, what I think really is, is really interesting was that when they started, they did quite a, a good job, a, a really good job, I think. I mean, they've uh, Paris Saint-Germain was straight away was on the map. Everybody knew about Paris Saint-Germain, especially when they bought Slatan. But also Thiago Silva in the beginning, when Leonardo, the Brazilian, was still their uh, sports director, he made some kind of very clever choices to buy the good players, to make the brand Paris Saint-Germain already like a big club in Europe. Now they're coming to the point where they want to win the Champions League and they decided to buy the biggest of them all. And Neymar, one of the best players in the world, and Mbappé, one of the best French players in the world, and also considered amongst the best. And okay, they took that risk. I think honestly, when they started, it was quite well. And now this, they they took a huge risk, and probably they will now pay the price for it. Pay in how so? 
I think that they should sell one of the two. Or well, we will see what will happen in next in the next weeks, months. But somebody will have to leave. I mean, it's clear that. And then we talk about football culture. There's now a German manager. There's a Portuguese sports director. They don't talk to each other, apparently. So there's quite a problem between the two. Uh, and Nasser Khalifi is there for a long time already now. And they still haven't won what they want to win, the Champions League. So I think that one of the three will leave, or maybe two, or maybe even all, all three of them. Just also maybe to erase all the the whole cursed story out of the out of the books. Yeah, uh, the uh, P- PSG says it's confident, by the way, that it can meet uh, financial fair play rules. Uh, so says uh, its boss, who recently unveiled the club's new main sponsor, Hotel Group Accor. Today we sign with Accor. As you know, that we're very satisfied. Fly Emirates, they were sponsors for 13 years. We'd like to thank them, thank them, you know, for their partnership. But, you know, we are a club very open for any partnership with any a new sponsor also. But today we are focusing in now an all an Accor uh, partnership deal. Now, uh, we spoke with our Arab language colleagues. This isn't just a, m- a money issue here. Fly Emirates, Emirati, owners of Manchester City, by the way, uh, the Emiratis and the Qataris politically at loggerheads right now what, with uh, the row between Qatar and uh, a group of Sa- Saudi-led uh, countries. They see, a lot of people in the newsroom see there's a political element as well, as is there is a political element in investing for a tiny nation like Qatar in Paris Saint-Germain. Of course it is. I mean, PSG has been, you know, for a few years, the Qatari kind of window to the footballing world because everybody knows that there will be World Cup play there. There are lots of questions. People are very hesitant. Lots of protests even. The, the Qatar's way of sort of showing what they, you know, putting their footballing culture again on, on display was buying the PSG and uh, attracting people that way. So it's that's also a, a big failure of uh, last night. Not It's not just the club that, you know, lost and, and had to leave the tournament, but actually a whole you know, uh, World uh, Cup hosting country, who probably had been calculating that by now they would have been at least in a final, you know, of the Champions League. So, uh, I also are there consequences for the next World Cup? I mean, does the, does last night's loss have an impact on Qatar's hosting of? Because we've done no. the stories about, you know, the stadiums built with uh, with cheap labor. Um, the fact that uh, there isn't really a football culture in mm. Qatar, that uh, the questions over uh, the bribes paid to the to FIFA w- with the, the awarding of the World Cups to Russia and Qatar. Does last night's result have an impact on the next World Cup? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's uh, the bad thing for PSG is that they have become, again, a loser brand a little bit. Uh, so, you know, it's bad invested money. You know, somehow because the, the the value at the moment isn't very high. Uh, Qatar, on the other hand, won the Asian Cup just a few weeks ago, so that's you know probably their. Uh, I mean, that's the, their national team, and that's a whole different story. So, I I notice when I see uh, Nasser Al Khalifa speaking with this kind of passion about um, business, you know, this new deal that we signed, and thank you to that. And if a little bit of that knowledge and a little bit of that passion was you know invested in football. It would have been a different sto- story, but I, I, you can tell from the way he communicates and the way PSG communicate how much they care about the business side of the club and how relatively little the rest matters, you know. Because yeah, that's the question we wonder with Qatar. How, how much money are they willing to spend? <laughs> hey. <laughs> you, it's a good question because they, one of the one of the problems of yesterday it means that do we have to stop? But, but it is difficult to stop because if, if you if you stop to put money, well, we are, to, to, PSG is safe till the next is, World Cup at least. Yeah, hmm? PSG is safe until the next World Cup. Yeah, uh, yeah, until the next World Cup. But also maybe you can try to to gain another kind of reputation that uh, only to be only a money investor. It's maybe to. Maybe to to try to to build something which were, could be very new in in, in Paris. It means that you build a club with a with an organization which is uh, rational. It means not a not a coach and a director of, of a sport which are in in conflict. Uh, you mean that you have a policy with the young players in the Parisian district and stuff like that. Do 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 they do they want to do this? They have the money to do this. 
But do we have the time? Do we have the, the fact that it will make the European Championship uh, uh, more <laughs> thorough than, than now? It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, I, th I think that the, the Paris Saint-Germain might something feel very costly for the, for the Qatar. Very costly. Rubens Trachter, uh, we, we, there's a bit of a dichotomy, isn't there? Because we're in France, a country that's been in the final of three of the last six World Cups, which is a pretty good record, right? Mm -hmm. um, and has won two of those. And yet at the club level, the only time uh, it's won the most prestigious cup was with a club that then was involved in a bribery scandal, Marseille. Uh, um, what do you make of the footballing culture in France? Yeah, interesting, interesting. I'm a Dutchman, so I, I see the football here in France as a Dutchman. I see a lot of differences uh, between the two countries. What I always thought really interesting, I worked quite a time at the, at the Stade de France, the national stadium, was the particular connection between the French fans and their national team, a lot more than local teams, for example. I have the idea that it's that it's way bigger than in other countries, for example. If you go to, let's say, Italy or England, for example, the club teams are so important. Uh, uh, clubs like uh, like Manchester United, like uh, in Italy, if you take Inter Milan or Juventus, for example, they are so, so well supported all over the country. And here in France, it, it's a lot more difficult, I have the idea. The, the, the local clubs, and especially the smaller clubs, um, they find it difficult to connect the people to them. And I see it with Paris Saint-Germain as well. And you can see it here in Paris. I mean, it's the most visited city in the world. It's a huge city. There's still one club in the highest division. And it's not that easy to get all those people connected. It should be, should be sold out every week. I mean, I, I mean, with so many good players. But they don't manage to, to do that. You agree, Anna Fran? Um, yes and no. I think the, the, the French public's relationship with, the, with their national team has been it's, been, it's close, you know, it's tight, but, uh, you know, looking at what's Wasn't happened... was the case in, in 2010. Exactly, look at what's happened, in the, in, you know, since <laughs> the last time they were in, in a World Cup final. I mean, it's, it's been such a roller coaster, and right. there has been so, you know, so many emotions around this team. So, uh, and it's also, uh, you compared with your home country, if I compare to Sweden, for example, the the political dimension of football in France is something extraordinary. I've never seen that anywhere else, it, where actually the, the Minister of Sport could go out to Clairefontaine and uh, actually, you know, ask to speak to to uh, the, the manager or the, the, who, whoever she wants in, in, in the national team and to give her political view of what's going on and why they are making a fool out of, out of the country and so on. That's rare. I've never seen that anywhere else. So in, in one way, I think you're right, that there is a very special relationship with the national team. Not always good, but, you know, people have a, are, have a big opinion about it. Uh, with the clubs, yes and no. I mean, in the north of France, there are lots of clubs with, you know, big public followings and that. Uh, Paris is particular, you know. Parisians aren't that easy to get on the boat. You know, there's so many other distractions around, I guess. Because I remember, sorry, I have to ask you this because you're Swedish. Yeah. But when Zlatan Ibrahimovic was here, one time he said, uh, the, the fans don't deserve Paris Saint-Germain, he said at one point. Or this country doesn't deserve Paris Saint-Germain. Yeah. Those, those words. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to take his defense just because <laughs> we share the passport. But I think what he meant, well, I guess what he meant was that... Uh, PSG at the time were growing too big for the, the Ligue 1, you know, let's face it, that's what they've become. It's uh, it's sometimes a bit ridiculous going to the Pacte de France, seeing them win 3, 4, 5, 0, uh, 9, 0, we've seen that as well. Mm. And knowing that, you know, come February, March, we will still be in this miserable situation, wondering why that doesn't happen in Europe. You know, it's the, 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 the difference is too big in some uh, respects, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's a very particular kind of uh, footballing culture, I, th I think, in France. So let me turn to the sociologist in the room, because I noticed something in 2016. France hosted the European Championships, and a lot of the visiting fans from countries like Northern Ireland, for instance, came with their songs, and there was all this talk on sports radio in this country about, oh, isn't it great? They sort of 
a discovery or a rediscovery of some of the football culture that you get elsewhere on the continent. Is there a globalization that you're sensing of sort of football culture, the kind of culture that Ruben was describing earlier? Of course, you know, for example, if you, in the 70s, there is a rebirth of French football at the club level with Saint-Étienne and at the national level with a, a World Cup in Argentina where France were not too bad. And she... We were robbed, but team. anyway. <laughs> hmm? We were robbed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, but it, it, it was the first time that uh, French beat some big, big, big clubs or have a good... Uh, what was better than, than she, she, it used to be. Uh, and at the moment, there was the, the rebirth of football. And in the, na- in the 80s, the uh, uh, birth on the, you can say, imitation or uh, contagion from the, from the British, from the Italian, with the with a, with a development of ultra culture in the France, in, especially in Paris Saint-Germain. Yeah, at the time they had hooligans. Big, 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 right, with hooligans and ultras and very... People killed, in fact. Very, yeah, yeah. Right, very tough situation. Yeah. Um, but in a country, I really agree with you when you say that there is a special relationship between the French football and, 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 and politics. Uh, because in, in France, they, you know, they, 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 the, Republic, the, the Republic doesn't like football. Really? No. No, she very public likes the clubs in the small vill- in the small town, small villages, because this is an association. This is the spirit of the of the city, but not in the way that in other countries, uh, in Britain, Scotland, or it's mobilized all people. One of the reasons is because in France you have very few big cities, because when you think of north, north of France, Lens, it's thirty thousand inhabitants. Uh, if you say Lyon, Paris, Marseille, okay, but it's much more smaller than. They. So the fear for politicians is that you're just going to pit Paris against the provinces if you if you're too. It was much into also the, the fact that all, all the people in, in France who were fond of football didn't dislike Paris because it was Paris was the center. There was always this attachment from the people living in Paris with their local uh, origins. It means a lot of people in Paris. For example, in, in the 80s. And is this changing? A little bit, a little bit. A little bit because the, the, the Parisian population had, had changed a lot in, during the, 30, the last 30 years. More people were born in Paris. People, for example, the, 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 the young immigrants, they are, the, the club are, are Paris. If they are living in the suburb, they, they love football, they, they can go to a Paris Saint-Germain. And it, it works after the hooligans have been... Um, uh, put away uh, in, in a Parc des Princes, right? no, no problem to go to a Parc des Princes when you are a young African. Or a, uh, so it means that a very change. But the, 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 the problem is the, you have these people who are fond of football in a, in a desert. In a desert. You have a lot of, yeah. It's, it's wrong. And the football culture, it's much more about the, the, the national team. And it's not a culture at all. I would say it's a just a national spirit. But not, but not a, it's not a, a way proper, to not a proper a footballing culture. Success of France, but not all right. Of, so there's change, but not a, not enough in that respect. Not enough. Not enough. Patrick Mignon, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank as well uh, Ruben Slachter. I want to thank as well Johanna Frenden for being with us. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.